it's okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to be talking about energy affordability understood in a broad uh, sense. Uh, because we are going to have uh, in an interesting mix of papers devoted to the analysis of both developed and developing countries. So as you know, and as will be apparent from the presentations, um, the, the problem of, affordabil for, of affordability and also the problem of poverty is quite different in uh, this kind of, uh, these two type of countries. And it, it's present in different shapes, affecting also differently uh, to those suffering from, from this. What is clear from the papers that uh, we uh, present here today is that regardless of the context in which the actions for affordability are taken or apply, the scientific research assessing the results of these uh, actions enhance our knowledge on the problem, but more important, on the potential solution that works trying to deal with the problem of affordability or poverty. So uh, we count today with the presentation, with the participation of three outstanding researchers. Uh, we start with Gerald Sunker. I wish, I hope the, the, the pronunciation is okay, but I'm not sure. My German is, is not so fluent. Uh, he is from Rhodes University. The second speaker is Daniel Davi from the Chair of Energy Sustainability. And the third uh, speaker, the, he will be ending the, the table of today, it's uh, Federico Acusi from University of Navarra. Now, before we start, I would like to remind that each speaker has between 15 and 20 minutes to deliver the speech and that the questions and answer session will be, take place, uh, will be taking place after the three presentations. So in case that we're running out of time, we can adjust uh, in that uh, moment. So for those of you that have questions, please hold it a little bit until the end, okay? Okay, um, one last announcement. Please, all of you that are present here physically, keep the face mask on all the time. Okay, it's very important. Now, I'm going to introduce the first paper that I think I have to... Here. Yes, I'm going to introduce this first paper in which, which is entitled Encouraging consuming activity through automatic switching of electricity contracts, a field experiment. Um, this study analyzed the role of automatic switching of electricity contracts on consumers' behavior when their consumers are comparing and switching between different suppliers. So next, uh, the speaker, Gerald Sunker, will explain this field experiment and the main uh, findings in pretty much uh, detail. So Gerald, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much at ELISA for already introducing me. And also thanks a lot at the organizers and especially Professor Maria Teresa Costa Campi for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks a lot. And before I'm going to start, I would like to highlight once more that um, this paper or this research piece is also an outcome of the constant cooperation that is growing with this symposium. So we in Bochum are also very glad to keep up this cooperation with the symposium, especially here with the Chair of Energy Sustainability, but also with other institutions like the University of Loughborough or Warwick. So thanks a lot to everyone. Now, my name is Gerald Zunker. I'm from the University of Bochum in Germany. And my presentation today is called Encouraging Consumer Activity Through Automatic Switching of the Electricity Contract. And this is a field experiment that I conducted jointly with multiple colleagues, including Christoph Feltas and Jörg Lingens, as well as Andreas Löschel, who's also here today. Now, the topic of this session is 
energy affordability. And so my presentation is also going to be about one of the key requirements of energy affordability, and that's consumer activity. And consumer activity is so important because regular searching for and switching between suppliers is a key to induce competition on the electricity market and thereby drive down markups and hence also reduce prices. When we have a look at the European electricity market though, we observe very little switching activity. And this is actually quite surprising because this market has been liberalized during the late 1990s, so consumers are free to switch their contract. And these consumers are also in general very eager to find a better contract. Now, what might assist consumers in becoming more active and switching their contract more often may be to automate the contract choice. And this is what we would call automatic switching of electricity contracts. Now, under this automatic switching of electricity contracts, the consumer delegates her decision right to a service provider. So the consumer delegates her right to choose between contracts to a service provider. And the service provider then always switches the consumer to a cheaper contract whenever possible. And what's also important to note about this service is that pre-specified preferences are taken into account and that this service is basically free of charge for consumers. So they don't have to pay for it. Now, this service, of course, brings the advantage that it reduces search and switching costs for consumers, and it does that permanently. And additionally, it also ensures that consumers do not forget to switch. Now, this service, therefore, might be by design a very effective way to increase consumer switching activity because it just reduces this hurdle of constantly being faced with search cost and switching cost. And therefore, it might also provide us with a new opportunity to increase competition in the energy market. Now, if we want to realize these potential gains that we associate with this service or that we associate with automation in general, then we have to clarify when and under which circumstances consumers are actually willing to use this automation. So the key question here for us was, when are consumers willing to use this automation service? And now to shed some light on this, we set up a large scale field experiment together with a German service provider. And this German service provider operates in the German electricity retail market where it runs an online comparison platform. And on this platform, it allows consumers to compare contracts of different suppliers across a whole range of dimensions. So consumers can, for example, compare prices, they can compare bonus payments, they can also compare uh, contract durations, or they could compare whether contracts offer green or non-green electricity. Now, besides this uh, pure comparison service, this provider also introduced such an automatic switching service. And it introduced this service just before our experiment that we conducted. And since the service was so new, the service provider that we worked with wanted to make the service known and therefore decided to write an email to about 8,000 previous customers. And in this email, the customer should then get the opportunity to enroll to the new service. Now, this email campaign of the provider that we worked with served as the setup for our experiment. And what we did here is that we randomly allocated all participants to three different experimental groups. We had a first group that was our control group. Then we had a treatment group or the first treatment group that we called delegation group and a second treatment group that we called control group. And here in this case, we then implemented our treatments by just varying the email text between the different groups. And we were then interested in, in how our treatments actually affect whether consumers sign up for the automatic switching service or not. So the sign up or the take up here of this service was our outcome variable that we were basically interested in. Now, in the control group that we had, 
we only explained this automatic switching service. In the delegation group that we had, we also explained this automation service, but additionally, as a treatment, we highlighted that consumers always stay in full control of their choices, because first of all, they can revoke every switch within 40 days free of charge, and they can do, do this with just one email. And second, if they are unsatisfied with a the switch, they can just revoke it also with just one email. And it's also free for them to cancel the service and they can do this just on a daily basis if they like to. Now, our hypothesis here for this treatment was that consumers might be more likely to take up this automatic switching service when they are explicitly told that they stay in full control of their choices. And finally, we had this bonus group. In this bonus group, you of course also explained the automatic switching service. But here we had the treatment where we highlighted that automatic switching protects consumers from electricity suppliers who pay high bonuses in the first year, and then hope that consumers forget to switch in the following year. And what's important to know here is that, um, in, at least in the German electricity market, it's the case that when you forget to switch your contract, the contract is usually extended by another year. And our hypothesis here for this treatment was that consumers might be more likely to use this automatic switching service when they are aware that it protects them from what you could call a bonus trap. Now, let's have a look at the data. As you know, we invited about 8,000 consumers to this experiment, and about 7,900 of them actually received the email. So we had about 100 emails that were bounced or didn't uh, reach the recipient for any other reason. And from those who received the email, actually about 2,600 opened the email. And this stage of opening the email is now quite important for our experiment because this is the point where our treatment kicks in. So consumers open their email, they have a look at it, they read it, and this is the point where they're being treated. And therefore we know that every activity or every action that consumers take after opening the email is of course conditional on this treatment. And what we then observe after opening the email is of course whether consumers sign up for this automatic switching service. And as you can see here, we had 124 customers in total who signed up for this automatic switching service. Now, for our experiment, of course, we are a bit le less interested in this total number of consumers signing up for the service. We are more interested in the conditional number. So we are more interested in how this number actually differs between our different experimental groups. And as you can here see on the next slide, we had uh, 48 customers in the control group signing up, 29 in the delegation group, and 47 in the bonus group. And then just with uh, a very simple two sample test of proportions, we could see that there's a significant difference between the control group and the delegation group, but no significant difference between the control group and the bonus group. And then besides these uh, descriptive or non-parametric results, I can also present you some uh, linear probability models. And in these models, we always investigate the relation between our treatments on the one hand and the automatic switching service on the other hand. So the sign up or the take up here of this automatic switching service is always what we use as the dependent variable. And in the first model that I'm going to show you, we only regress this automatic switching tape up on the treatments. And then in the third and the second model, we just add some further controls or some covariates here. And we control in the second model for consumers' annual electricity consumption. We control for their age as well as for their gender. And finally, in the third model, we control for whether consumers use green electricity and whether they are active switchers. And here in this case, being an active switcher means that the last switch of the consumer was no longer than one year ago at the time of our experiment. So it was no longer ago than just one period uh, of the usual contract duration. Now, here you have the 
uh, three models. In the top row, you can see the uh, treatment effect for our delegation treatment. And as you can see, this delegation treatment had a negative but highly significant effect here. And then in the second row, you can see the effect for the bonus treatment. This has a positive sign, but is uh, indeed insignificant. And then you can further see that some of our uh, control variables also correlate with whether consumers take up this automation service or not. So you can see here that consumers who are older are slightly more likely to use the automation service. And you can see that consumers who use, gre uh, who use yeah, green electricity and that are active switches are more likely to use this automation service. Now, what can we see here? Now we can see for the delegation treatment that consumers are actually less likely to use the automatic switching service when we highlight that they always stay in full control of their choices. And I have to highlight here that um, this result that we see actually opposes our initial hypothesis. So we thought that if we would highlight that they stay in control, they would be more likely to use the service. But actually here we observe the opposite. And what might be a potential explanation, but this is just a, a bit of speculation about it, is that this treatment might make consumers realize even more strongly that they have to hand over the decision right to the service provider. So it might have made them even more reluctant to give this decision right out of hand to the service provider. And for the bonus treatment, we see that highlighting that automatic switching protects consumers from what I called this bonus trap has no effect on whether they sign up to the service or not. And again, here a potential explanation might be that um, this is, or this result may be related to the high level of expertise here in our sample. Because all the participants that we invited here in our experiment are former customers of the switching platform that we worked with. So all of them have switched their contract in the past, so they are quite likely to be experienced switchers and have a bit of knowledge about the electricity markets and how uh, service providers usually work or how they might uh, lure consumers into this bonus trap. So for these experienced customers, our experiment or our treatment might not have provided any new information and therefore we might not see an effect here. Now, what we can learn from this experiment is that our arguments that were designed to foster this automatic switching have been ineffective, so in case of the bonus treatment, or even had detrimental effects in case of our delegation treatment. And as a consequence, it might be a bit more difficult to realize these gains that we associate with automatic switching than we uh, thought it would be. And further, we can also learn some lessons for future research, because here in this experiment, we can see that um, these aspects of delegation, so delegating a choice to a service, or also um, delegating decision rights to a third party seem to matter for automation. But here in this experiment, we observe something that we cannot um, explain in a way. So we cannot identify or say anything about in which way these aspects of control or delegation of decision rights matter. And therefore, we would need to generate a better understanding on how this allocation of decision rights affects automation choices. And now, just as a very final remark from uh, my side, if you are interested in learning a bit more about uh, how this automation and the delegation of decision rights might interrelate in a way, then please also join the IAB hybrid seminar on Thursday, where I'm going to present a follow-up on this. So just, this is just a small advertisement, but I would be very happy if you would join. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gerald, for your presentation. Uh, we move forward to the next uh, presentation. We'll have the next speaker is uh, Daniel David. Uh, the paper is entitled Economic Efficiency and CO2 Impacts from the Clean Cooking Program in Ecuador. This article analyzes 
the economic and environmental impacts of a very large scale uh, clean cooking problem, who, which uh, aim at reducing the financial burden of uh, the subsidies that were applied to uh, LPG. So the speaker will give us full detail of this study applied to, to Ecuador. Daniel, the floor is Okay, yours. thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, I'm Daniel Davi from the Chair of um, Energy Sustainability and the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. And the co-author of this paper is Moises Obaco from the Universidad Católica del Norte de Fasea de, in Chile. Um, this paper, uh, well, this is the outline of my presentation. We'll see the background, the aim and hypothesis, literature, data results, and uh, policy recommendations. Just to put in the context where we are, uh, three billion people in the world still cook using uh, open fires, which has uh, healthy problems, uh, has uh, health problems consequences in the, um, in the population, and it's estimated that almost four million people die annually to, to consequence of these cooking technologies, and almost a half of the childhood uh, deaths are also related to this uh, consequence. Moreover, 10% of people still do not have access to electricity. If we have this in mind, there are too many uh, clean cooking policies around the world, but Ecuador launched a, a clean uh, cooking program in 2014, which was not uh, as the same than other countries. In this uh, policy, they aim to replace LPG uh, uh, with renewable production. We, ha we should have in mind that many countries uh, make a, a not the same step. They change open fires to LPG, so Ecuador decides to, to go a step further. Because they want to, to, the, to have three expected benefits, they want to improve environmental conditions, they have large hydropower conditions, and they want to, to reduce a large burden on LPG subsidies. In Ecuador, LPG is subsidized in 90% of the, of the cost, so consumers pay a lot cost. This uh, policy aims to, to, to engage 3 million people, but only 700,000 people were involved. However, we want to know if these uh, people, uh, how, how this, this policy was uh, efficient, if not. Some points of this policy, just a brief summary, there was a, a poor case uh, credit to, to, to buy an induction cooker. Uh, there were agreements with local manufacturers. There were some, some taxes uh, exemptions. And the most important point was a monthly credit uh, subsidy or free electricity consumption, uh, 80 kilowatts hour for cooking and 20 kilowatts hour if they have water heating devices and 100 kilowatts if they have both water and cooking. To put in context with the literature, uh, well, most of these studies are constrained by a lack of information. They are based on surveys. However, in this paper, I will show you later, we use real data. We don't use a survey. So um, the, we think this is an important contribution to the literature. And uh, in the literature, this, this policy has been explored only before the implementation with the scenarios, but up to our knowledge, uh, this has not been explored uh, after the implementation. So we will try to, to see what has happened. What are the aims of this paper? We want to evaluate the economic and environmental impacts. We want to verify if indeed renewables cover the subsidized electricity as the government promised. And we want to quantify the potential impact or the real impact on CO2 emissions and the LPG consumption. So uh, this is the data, summary statistics. We use data from the Ecuadorian National Regulatory Authority and the Ecuadorian Central Bank. We have pro uh, the data from the production from its technology, from LPG consumption. You will see the data in the, in the results. Uh, well, first of all, we make a stationarity analysis and we conclude that we should use variables and differences because uh, 
is the, the way to, to have to fulfill the conditions. Let's go to the, to the empirical approach. We have a threefold empirical approach. Uh, what are we estimating or what we do? First of all, we want to check if indeed uh, LPG, if renewables, electricity is a substitute good from LPG in general. We want to, to check if the specific subsidiary electricity is also, uh, has replaced LPG consumption as was the aim of this policy. Once we know that, we want to know which technologies are used to cover the residential consumption. Before the policy and during the policy, we want to know if there are some changes and we find some changes. And we want to know uh, at, at the end, in, in the third empirical approach, what is the technology used to cover the subsidized electricity. Uh, I think uh, we, can, we can go to the, the empirical approach and it's the more interesting results we find here. First of all, when we estimate if electricity has, is, a, is, is a substitute good from LPG, we find that in general it is. Each megawatt of electricity consumed reduces 0.9 barrels of LPG. When, when we check the, the, the specific subsidized electricity, we find this effect is much greater. So uh, the policy seems to have a, a, a positive and an efficient effect. When we check what technologies can be, has been used to cover the residential consumption, we see in the first column, that before the policy, uh, both renewables and thermal plants were used to cover this growth in the residential consumption. We should have in mind that variables are differentiated. But during the policy, this is the second column, the only significant variable is the associated to renewables. Therefore, this confirms that during the policy, renewables were used to cover the electricity. This, this point is very important. Well, we will go to the, the, next, the next empirical approach, the last, and I will comment one point. And finally, we check about the specific subsidized electricity to know which technology has been used to, to produce. And uh, if, you have, if you remember, I have explained that the government promised using hydropower. So we find and we confirm that indeed the subsidized electricity was produced by renewables and we find in the second column that by hydropower. This, this result is very important because uh, with this we discard a trade-off between uh, one, one concern from this policy was that the void C2 emissions related to LPG were trade-off with pollutant electricity. In this case, we find that it wasn't. The, the new electricity was covered with clean technologies and they were produced by hydropower. Putting all data together, uh, we, we write the following picture. And here we see for the six years of this policy from 2015 to 2020, we see the annual CO2 emissions in Ecuador, we see the subsidized electricity, and using information from the, the barriers uh, save for each megawatt, and we know the, the subsidized electricity, we calculate the savings on LPG consumption at national level. We find that 20% of the LPG consumption was safe. So if we wouldn't have this policy, the LPG consumption would have been 12% higher. We calculate the corresponding CO2 emissions to burning this LPG and we calculate the CO2 savings. So what is important and what we find in this policy is that the, the cost of the subsidy is smaller or cheaper than the, the safe uh, subsidies on LPG. It's important that in this comparison we are not considering other indirect costs related to lower incomes, uh, to taxes, but it's important that although we had not the expected uh, engagement rate, this small engagement rate achieve these results. 
just as conclusions, uh, what I have been explaining, 7,000 people were, in, were enrolled. We have positive economic and environmental benefits. We have a 1.6 rate of return of the subsidies on, on electricity. We find that the avoided CO2 emissions are not trade-off with generation. This was a concern in the literature and from, from other authors. And we calculate on 1.26% of the annual CO2 emissions uh, were uh, the impact of this policy. Regarding the, yeah, to, to finish the policy recommendations from this policy, uh, what we think is that it should be uh, important to provide better information on this policy, especially for the, the government and the public authorities, not only to communicate uh, the, well, the low engagement rate, it was a, a reality, but especially to, to explain the positive and negative KPIs and with the impact on CO2 emissions, the impacts on LPG. And it's important to explain that if there are savings on subsidies, this state, this, this uh, spending can be spent in, in roads, in health, in education. And having information from individuals, it also could be important to explain what has been the individual contribution to, to this policy in CO2 emissions, in, in this public uh, state spendings, and all these kind of KPIs. Uh, however, the reality is that politicians are quite, well, are self-centered and hardly recognize and knowledge positive from their predecessors, especially if they are from different parties. And as a proposal, we think that future policies should include the obligation, the legal obligation to publish these reports at the end of the policy, which would provide higher transparency, higher credibility in institutions, and at the end, a greater incentives to better design efficiently the policy. Uh, if uh, policies are not properly designed at the end, the, the results cannot be as good as enough. And well, to the, in the last slide, we are also working in a second stage of this analysis to know why the, the determinants of the low enrollment rate to this policy, and we are using uh, data from regional households uh, characteristics and social characteristics. And what we are finding is that uh, they are explaining the, the, the low enrollment rate to this kind of geographical characteristics. But this is the, the second paper we are now think, uh, finishing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan Thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. And now, and for keeping the time just very tight, now we, uh, we move to the last presentation of this table. Uh, now, uh, this, this paper is entitled Power, Reliability, and Grid Connection, Evidence from Rural Guatemala. And this article uh, analyzed the, in this article, we, we have a study that analyzes the determinants of and also the incentive uh, of households in rural areas of Guatemala to connect to electricity grids. But the emphasis is placed on the role that the reliability of this connection have on the decision to connect to, to the grid. So it's quite interesting. And now the speaker, Federico Acusi, will explain this analysis in detail. So Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for the university for giving me the chance to present my, my research. This is part of my PhD thesis. So any comment, any suggestion, we will be welcome. And to be honest, I am not from Guatemala. I am from Argentina, but I have learned a lot from this country. I hope to visit one day. And well, I want to share with you the, some of the key findings. The motivation for, for this paper is especially, well, what called my, my, my attention when I was doing the research, it was an article that I read from a local paper in Guatemala, but basically it says, we don't want light bulbs, we need schools. So that caught my attention, and, 
And one thing that I, I was thinking about, it was, well, many effort is done to expand the grid and how that expansion, it really takes into real connections. As, as it was said before, we need to, uh, to see the measures of, uh, of how people get connected because electrification access doesn't necessarily mean that the people has real grid connections. And this is the case of Guatemala, and electrification access means that may maybe I do not have electricity, but if my neighbor has, I am accounted as, as if I had. So what I'm going to do in this paper is to focus on grid connections, real grid connections. <clears throat> so the empirical question is how uh, power reliability affect household willingness to grid connect. So I'm going to test if uh, power reliability is or not uh, a barrier to electrification. And my methodological approach will be using two regression models. I will use two different um, databases. One is a national survey conducted in 2011 and 2014. And I'm going to explode the variation, the time and spatial variation in quality. And I will use also the national population census in 2018, which gives me more granular uh, detail. And I will use official records of a quality service. So why Guatemala? Guatemala, um, because it has experienced a boost for rural expansion, and especially because this is, I think, the, the key fact that 90% of residential energy consumptions came from firewood, and only five from electricity. So there's a huge work to do there, and there's also a lo local urban and rural gap um, which is really stressed. Uh, you have to think that in Guatemala, 50% of the people lives in the urban area and 50 in the rural one. And that gap is also seen in uh, inequality. So get it into the literature review. Mainly of the works here has been focused on the industrial sector. And that means, well, how power reliability affects productivity, average unit costs, uh, the decision uh, to invest in backup generation. And at household level, the, um, the literature has mainly focused on the electri electrification benefits. Um, and there are two papers there, one a very interesting literature review, and the other one is from Grogan. Journal Economic of Development, and uh, he studies the Guatemalan case. It is really interesting. He, he, he stressed the, um, how people getting into to Grid Connect affect income and to reduce the gender gap. And <clears throat> there's another branch of the literature that um, is a stress on willingness to pay, and other people have stressed uh, the reliability issue and I want to focus especially on Dan and La. It is the second paper that appears there because um, he uses a methodology that I will use later. And he, he studies the Vietnam case. And he used an IB strategy that I will use later on. And many of these papers, when they study quality, they do it with a methodology that relies on subject, subjective measures. What does it mean? That many people in the survey is asked, well, uh, tell me, how many hours didn't, didn't you have electricity in the last month or in the last semester? So the problem is that you are trusting on the respondent memory or you are trusting on he, how he is uh, suffering the problem of, of electricity quality, especially in the Likert scale, because they are just asking you, how do you measure uh, how do you think is your quality uh, supply? Very good, good, fairly good. So it's, diff it's a categorical measure and it's difficult to get it into to an, an objective measure. So I think that the contribution from this paper will be, um, well, using an objective, um, an objective measure of quality to study uh, the role of reliability in, as a factor to grid connect and to, 
see an empirical evidence in Latin America. So a big picture of Guatemala. Guatemala is a Central American country, is five times smaller than Spain, and it is in the south of Mexico, and it has a population of around 14 million people. In the left, you can see the regions of Guatemala. They are really re related to, um, to weather conditions. Regions are divided into departments, and departments are divided into 340 municipalities, which you can see in the picture of the right. The, the rural areas are divided into three large firms that provide electricity to households. The, one, the green one that you can see is from the OXA, provides to the west. The ORSA, the yellow one, provides into the east. And EXA, the better company in terms of reliability, provides electricity to the central part of the country, and especially to the metropolitan area of Guatemala. How I define um, the, quality, the quality measure I'm going to use is SAIDI, which means System Average Interruption Duration Index, which is basically the average number of hours that the household does not have electricity in a semester. This is the great picture I would like to focus on because you can see the, um, the quality around, uh, along the, across time, the three different companies, and especially the shift in Saidi in 2012 up to 2014. So getting back to what I said before, I had the national survey in 2011 and 2014. So I have the two pictures, the picture with, let's say, good quality and the picture with bad quality. And well, why this sudden shift in Saidi? I will assume that is is exogenous. I have some arguments to say that. Um, we are not to discuss it now because of lack of time, but uh, especially is it socinous to household decisions. It has been more a problem of the firms than a problem of the households. And here in this table, I have what I want to focus is in the, in the service cutoff. You can see 17 and 21 percent of services cut off in the firms of the OXA and the ORSA, the green one and the yellow one. So I'm going to focus on them. I'm going to see um, how this quality uh, shift affects the, the decision to grid connect. So I'm going to use two models, two LS. The first one with the national survey. And well, why is the grid connection variable? and Saidi quality. I'm going to skip this one and go to the results. Well, the first one, as you can see in the, on, the bottom, on the top, there's a negative sign, so that means that 1% uh, increase in Saidi, so less quality, it means 18% less of probability of grid connect. So if you will remember the, the, the table before, when I had information on 2014 in the proportion of cuts off, it gives you a point because we have there 17, 24, 21% of people that haven't paid their bill or have decided to not being part of the company anymore. And the OLS in the census where we have better, a better picture of quality that number reduces to almost 3%, 2.5. So there are some potential issues. The, the first one is the one I said before. OK, perhaps the quality shift in 2012 is not fully exogenous, so I will use an IB strategy. The second potential issue is, OK, perhaps I, haven't, uh, I have the information at municipality level. When I make the average, I just make a mean average, so I have to make a weight average. That's the second potential issue. And the third one, I didn't say before, but in the census, as I have all the observations of Guatemala, and I had the information which one has electricity with, solar, with the solar panels, I decided to avoid them because uh, it most probably in the Guatemala context that that solar panels are for isolated areas, so they didn't have the choice where to grid connect or not. They just give you the solar panel and to solve you the, the problem. So then I, I dropped them at first, but now I re-include it to see if results change or not. 
IB strategy, I use rainfall as the instrumental variable. I live in the countryside once, and uh, for me, the intuition is very simple. When there was a large storm, power electricity cuts off. It's a precaution measure, and also, perhaps, rainfall is very difficult, especially in the Guatemalan context. You have forests. It's difficult to get into the to areas where power grid lines maybe um, you have to, to fix them. So it is reasonable to think uh, IB, uh, rainfall, sorry, as an IB strategy. And I, sorry, and I use two potential ish, um, sources. The one is from the weather station, the national survey, the weather national service of Guatemala. And the other one is to use NASA uh, satellite, satellite images. There you have in the map in the right, the quality, and it, sorry, in the left, and in the right, the, the, the precipitation from each department of Guatemala. There you have the same picture, but with grid connection in green. So results using, sorry, I have to see here. Using the two potential sources of rainfall variation, column one and column two, analyzes weather stations. The F test is good to test if the instrument is weak or not. So we have there a 27% in the effect of Saidi, while in the third and fourth column, the F test is giving us information that is not a good instrument to use, the NASA satellite images. For the census database that analyzes only 2018, just the picture of that, I'm, I'm using the information of quality at municipality level, and rainfall is, now, is, no, is not anymore a good instrument to use, so I follow Dangan La to, see, um, to use the other, um, I'm going to use the average of Saidi of the rest of the municipalities that belongs to my department as an instrument. And the results, columns one and two test rainfall, and as you can see, the F test uh, gives me information that is a weak instrument, while the methodology of Langanla, it gives me strong uh, evidence that it is a good instrument to use. And again, the results are very similar to OLS around 3% of the effect, on, the effect of Saidi on grid connection. And finally, the two final tables, the one that stresses the other two potential issues that I said before, the one that uses Saidi as a weighted measure, all the effect, the negative effect persists. And the last one, using a placebo test you can see in the last two columns, I used uh, two different um, variables. The first one, instead of using grid connection, I use water grid access or garbage service selection. I use the same model, and there are no results there. So though those two placebo tests give me information that the, there's a plausible effect of uh, quality on grid connections. So the conclusions are basically on related on policy issues is that uh, reliability should be taken into account when you expand the grid, because you, maybe you are expanding the grid, you are giving, let's say, more electrification access, as we said before, but we don't give more grid connections, which is the really measure that we, we need. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you, Federico, for your presentation. And I think we have time for questions from the floor. Uh, so those that wants to, okay. First one over there, Mike. Um, so a question for Gerald. Um, and one of the most interesting things I thought about your work was the fact that they, these were all active people in the sense that they'd signed up to a switching service in some, at some stage. Uh, 
but nearly all of them didn't want to participate in the experiment. And so one interesting question, I think, is was there any difference in the characteristics of those who decided to at least participate in the experiment from the vast majority of people who decided not to participate? Um, just, just as a brief answer to it, between those, uh, we of course uh, randomized all participants at the stage where we had this big, big bunch of 8,000 people. Um, of course, people could or do self-select in whether they actually open the email. That's, that's of course, um, a stage where you could have self-selection, but um, I don't know whether there are any characteristics that are very specific to those who actually open the email or then um, go or take this step. Um, because what, what we observe here in our experiment, and this is also what we uh, look at with our covariates, is from the stage of opening the email to the stage of signing up for the email. So because um, we only take, take those as the sample who are uh, being treated, because only those are uh, those for which we can yeah, condition them on the different groups. But I would have to look up whether there's any difference in uh, characteristics between those who actually received the email and those who opened it. So uh, I don't know whether there are any, any good characteristics that, um, that are very specific to those who opened the email or those who did not open it. No, that, that seems to be an interesting issue. Why, of those people who opened it, you know, uh, was there any difference between them and, and but didn't go any further and the people who went somewhat further? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, maybe especially to those who are more active in switching, there could be a, a selection or maybe also to those uh, who use green electricity. So there might be, might be some characteristics that uh, might correlate with whether they open up this email or not. Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks a lot to the three presenters for excellent presentations. I really enjoyed them very much. Uh, well, I have uh, one question. Uh, to Daniel uh, about his study, which I also enjoyed very much. <laughs> well, uh, my question is, uh, well, you, you come up to the conclusion basically that the, that the policy, that before the policy, the, the, most, the most widespread technology was a polluting one, and after the policy, uh, you know, there was like a kind of a policy effect or policy additionality effect uh, in which uh, we see that the policy leads to the deployment or the adoption of the of the cleaner technologies, the renewable energy technologies. But my question is whether you, you control for the cost of the technology as well, because I, I, am, I assume that there might be a reduction in this cost. So, you know, it's not, maybe it's not totally attributable to the uh, effects of the policy, but also to the reduction in the cost. But I don't know, it's just a simple question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Well. We are not controlling at all by the prices because if you look at the, um, we should have a, in mind uh, what is the, the market design in, in this country, which is not the same than, than in Europe. But what the idea is, uh, if you look at um, the production in, in, in this time, at the end, the government uh, before, I don't remember the year before, the implementation of the policy opened new hydropower plants. So the, the hydropower electricity is, I think it's subsidized or has a maximum price, which is, is, is small. And this obviously produces the, this effect on the thermal plant. But at the end, what we were trying to capture is that if the, the consumption profile related to, to residential is indeed covered by renewable and not by thermal plants, because at the end thermal plants are the most uh, easy to, to, to redispatch and to follow the, the, the residential consumption. So this is why we were looking this this idea, because if you look at the aggregate uh, uh, profile, you see that the hydropower increases, but we were looking just this 
specific uh, rate to see if just the new consumption is covered only with this. This is what we are trying to, to explain. But you are right, we should uh, include, explain better the part of the, the market prices. Okay, thanks Thank a lot. you. Thanks very much. the presentation, very interesting. Um, in my question is for Gerald, also related with a uh, uh, question very similar to, the, to Mike. But uh, I really, I, I think that it's really relevant the engagement and active participation of consumers in the markets. And I think that it's really relevant this kind of experiments in order to identify which are the barriers in order to promote this uh, more active participation. For me, the switch, the advantages of the switching activity for the customers is that they have savings, economic savings for changing one contract to another one. And my question is, in your experiment, the customers who are participating in the experiment, they have information of the potential savings and the savings they achieve during the experiment? Because I think that it's a relevant question in order to increase this participation in the, in the experiment or in terms of attitude towards the change. Thank you. So here for the experiment, we could not provide participants with uh, information on uh, their potential savings. And the reason basically is that you would have to take a forward looking position to the following years. So you, can, um, you cannot assess what consumers are going to save maybe the next year or the following year. You could do that for, uh, for one switch, that's what you could do. But if you do that for each consumer individually, then you would also kind of uh, induce another treatment to the experiment. So people would be treated with how much they could save and uh, thereby we would at least slightly d dilute our treatments and this is why we uh, did not do that here in our experiment. So we really wanted to have just one variation here. Some more question? Yeah. Here. Yes, so thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, Danny, I have a question for you. I was wondering, because uh, during my time at the Inter-American Development Bank, I, I was looking at this uh, program, but from another perspective, in the sense, trying to understand why, um, so there are many uh, reasons why the uptake was very low. And one is, without any doubt, the fact that you need to invest in this, uh, you need to switch the, the, your infrastructure in the home, and only rich people can do this, even if there is, um, so, uh, uh, I mean, rich people in the sense that, uh, that this is not uh, going to the poorest, right? And so um, I was wondering if you, if you thought about the fact that when you switch uh, uh, subsidies for, uh, if, if the, this analysis you did was really focusing on those households or was more in general, because when you fade out subsidies, you fade out of subsidies for everybody. Um, so on the, on the distributional aspects of this uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you, very good question. Um, what we are doing in the second paper, I have not shown here, we are studying uh, what you are saying, the determinants of the low engagement rate. And what we are finding is that the main barrier to participate is the poor case of the, the induction stove. And we uh, make a calculation on what is the threshold in the income from people that participate in not. So we have information and we are calculating. So a uh, proposal we make in the second paper is to try to adjust, for instance, to, to include a subsidy to, to, to buy the, the induction cook stove. And we calculate for those whose people uh, we should include that, considering the incomes. And we also make an analysis using the social characteristics, the etnia, uh, education, uh, environmental concerns. So we are trying to explain that. But you are right, the main barrier is that. Is that, and another one that, the reliability of the induction stoves, because some people were compliant, so in that paper we make some recommendations in the way to, to instead of buying the, 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 the stove, a way to, to have a rent or um, 
for the period, you put case and you have all the maintenance of the, in order to achieve reliability. So the problem, the, the main barrier is related to the, to the poor case of the induction cooker. You are right. And also there are some papers that show that once you, uh, maybe you invest in them, but then you don't use them. There are many, many barriers, right? Yeah, the, um, because it's not the same cooking with LPG than electricity. You should be aware the information, the time of cooking is different. So many information. This is what we are doing in the, in the second paper. Yes, because the, here we are just studying the efficiency. But as we have to know of data. We are preferring to, to make two or three analyses in, with this. Thank you. Well, yeah, OK, it works. Uh, thank you for all the uh, presenters, for the presentations. I have a question to, for Federico. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you could do a difference in difference analysis because you seem to have like a sharp uh, contrast between two years and therefore you could look at before and after uh, looking at maybe the municipalities that are the most comparable in your, in your sample. And something else, a more general question is uh, whether you're only capturing uh, the uh, worsening of the uh, reliability of the grid when you, when you look at these different companies because maybe because the companies are not doing as well Maybe they're not as good as well when it comes to connecting people to the grid. Maybe there are like longer delays or, or something. So you, you could be capturing more than only uh, what, what you want to capture. Yes, thank you for the, for the question. Yes, in fact, it is like a, a diff and diff in the sense that I have a before, I have an after. About, and regarding the, what it is capturing, um, I, I think the... Um, Quality has many issues here, and uh, so far what I have read from the two firms, reliability, the, the quality of the service is it wasn't it wasn't good, not only in the Saidi measure that I used, but there were many other issues that I didn't they didn't accomplish. For example, time of connection, for example, time of reconnection when people uh, didn't pay perhaps and have the cutoff. And in detail, because I'm uh, sorry I, I passed it uh, so fast, but the, the penalization or the compensation that the companies had to pay, it was a lot. So perhaps it's not measuring only Saidi, but Saidi is very correlated with another measures of bad quality for the companies. Okay, uh, to finish, I, will have, uh, I would like to ask some que one question to Federico as well. Uh, I'm, one, I'm wondering if uh, you have, you know, if the consumers have information on the quality of the connections before they get connected to, to the grid, or it's just after they connect to the grid that they realize how uh, reliable is this connection. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I, I really do not have information on that. Um, what I assume is that I, I can put it on, on their shoes in the sense I am living in a rural in a rural zone, and well, every people knows which is the, the quality in that in that region in that in my in my small town, and the other thing that I would like to test, but I do not have enough information for that. When you see the newspapers in Guatemala, everyone is complaining not only because of the quality, but also for the the, the price, the final price for the electricity. The final price, I didn't have time to say this, but the final price has two components. The first one is, the, let's say, a social tariff that everyone pays the same and is very low, but the thing is that each municipality charges an additional cost that is a tariff, and it's a fixed amount of the, of the, of the bill. So that really penalizes poor people, which pays a lot for the electricity, and it's a counter incentive to, to those to grid connect. I just control, I use it as a control, the public light tariff, but it's another interesting question to, to see the impact of this uh, public light tariff on the final bill and on the final decision to grid connect. Perfect, thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for, for their presentation. And now it's time to, uh, for a coffee break, and we have to come back here by 11.45, okay? Thank you.